The NFL, similar to Gillette Razors, has a lot of fresh new faces on several NFL teams. The NBA playoffs is live and entertaining as always, and we finally have a, a team in the Eastern Conference Finals. We're going to talk more about the Eastern Conference Finals, Western Conference Finals, and all the playoffs that are taking place, including live updates of the New York Knicks and the Indiana Pacers. And the NHL, we officially have a entrant in the Eastern Conference Final, actually both entrants in the Eastern Conference Final live right now, and of course the PGA Championships. What a crazy event it was this morning with Scotty Scheffler, the world's number one golfer. We're going to talk about everything that happened with that and, of course, everything that has taken place on the field. I'm your host, Matthew Raritan, and this is Total Sports Talk Beyond the Lights. Welcome to another episode of Total Sports Talk Beyond the Lights. I'm your host, Matthew Raritan, and it has been crazy this weekend because of everything that's happening at the PGA Championship, but it's even more crazier because even though it's not the NFL season, it's off season, there still seems to be so much news circulating in the NFL, and I love it because uh, I hate having to wait till the fall just to hear NFL news and to see kind of what's happening there. Uh, But the NFL has just been alive and well, but so has the playoffs in the NBA and the NHL. But before we take a dive into both those, I want to introduce both of my co-hosts here today. First, I want to welcome back David Street. What's up, everybody? And no, I did not get a uh, new studio. Um, This is actually my uh, friend's office. My laptop is uh, getting getting repaired right now, and my friend was gracious enough to uh, let me use his studio. But there's, all, but there's a good chance I won't be back next week, but I didn't want to miss Friday. Who doesn't want to miss Friday? So won't, uh, good chance I won't be here next week, but well, no, no, I'll be here in spirit. Yeah. yeah well, it's, a, it's a nice uh, setup, though, so I appreciate yeah. him letting you use that. And Isn't secondly, we, we've got Ed Smith. Welcome, y'all. Well, guys, the NFL, this offseason, it's really been – Pretty hectic, I think more so than I've seen in recent years with free agency, the NFL draft, that it's almost hard to kind of pinpoint where the heck everyone has ended up. And you guys may not be the only ones that are seeing that, but there's a lot of new faces on new teams this year. Some are veterans, some are uh, fresh rookies straight out of uh, college. So I kind of want to go over a lot of these new faces on new teams and also rank them as well and we didn't really get to do this last year because well he suffered a season ending achilles injury and hopefully this year we could talk more about him Um, no i'm not talking about kirk thuggins i'm talking about aaron Rodgers and the new york jets and this is gonna be the first time we're really going to see him play hopefully he doesn't suffer another uh, season ending injury but Aaron Rodgers New York Jets uh do you guys like this uh matchup for them I mean are this them coming together you really feel like this is a good combination for the Jets having Aaron Rodgers there Aaron Rodgers being on this team with so many young stars up and coming stars being the old guy the old grizzled guy that's been around he took all of last year and while doing the rehab to try and get back before the end of the year, which he was very close to doing, he took a lead role within that clubhouse and on that team, which not undermined Zach Wilson playing, but he thought he was actually helping Zach Wilson develop. And that at this point, should be Aaron Rodgers' role, not just to be the savior of a franchise, but to be able to pass down to who the next person is going to be after him. 
Yeah, there are definitely going to be some big shoes to fill, but uh, it's also one of those that you do not mind sitting behind a guy like that because of the incredible talent and just so much that he can share to you of his experience. So I think Aaron Rodgers and the Jets are going to be one of the top teams that we're going to talk about here on this list. Uh, David, is there anything you want to add as far as Aaron Rodgers and the Jets? I mean, the only thing that I'll add for now is I think when you're talking about all the teams that have new uh, quarterbacks, like new starting quarterbacks, I don't think there's any question that the Jets are number one with, with it, with Aaron Rodgers. Now we're going to go over the rest of our rankings and, you know, I don't know, I don't know about you guys, but for me personally, Number one and number 10 were very easy for me to decide. It was like that middle section, you know, two through nine. That was like very hard for me to decide. But first place was very easy. Last place was was, was a was very easy for me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know I joked about him and when it came to uh, torn Achilles as well. But this number two team uh, uh, that I want to talk about is the Falcons and Kirk Cousins and a surprising, shocking pick in the draft. Michael Penix Jr. out of Washington. So uh, let's talk about really quick that surprise draft pick here in Michael Penix. I was I remember watching the NFL draft and when they announced his name, I was in complete utter shock. And I imagine you guys were as well. And I guess you want to say the more you look at it. It, I don't want to say makes sense, but you could kind of see why they did it. But no, Matthew, nothing about this pick makes makes sense. Like this isn't one of those things where you can look back in hindsight and go, "Well, on second, no, this was a horrible, horrible pick." And it always will be a horrible pick. I will say Quit that doing mental gymnastics. Yeah, I will <laughs> say them drafting a quarterback. I could get behind, just not a quarterback this early. So they could have drafted a quarterback later in the draft where they were like, all right, well, we want to put someone behind Kirk Cousins, one, because of his injury history, but two, uh, you know, longevity. I don't know, but this was not the pick to do that with. So let me ask this question. How different is this situation with Michael Penix and when the Packers took Jordan Love uh, to replace Aaron Rodgers? Well, How different are these two situations in your mind? Well, wasn't I mean Jordan Love was a late first round pick, wasn't he? Yes, he and, was in the twenties. Yeah, I mean, like, call me crazy here, but I've always been under the impression that if you're going to take a guy, you know, in the in the top in the top ten or whatever, that you do it with the intention to start him pretty much right away. I understand there are there are exceptions like like Patrick Mahomes was the 10th pick, and he started behind Alex Smith. I, I, I get that. But I think there's a difference between drafting someone in the uh, in the uh, t- uh, top 10 after you literally just signed a veteran quarterback to one of the, the largest deals ever in NFL history, right? And with a guy like, you know, George Jordan Love, I mean, the plan with Jordan Love was always to develop him uh, behind Rodgers, and that's exactly what they did. I mean, if the Packers, if the Packers did what uh, – you know, if the Packers did what the, the Falcons did under the same circumstances, they'd be idiots too. Yeah, and well, well Green Bay also had a guy named Devontae Adams at the time. So uh, Atlanta does not have a guy like that. I mean, Drake London's a young talent um, and Kyle Pitts, but they needed more weapons, and they failed to do that because they drafted Michael Penix Jr. So I, I just – Yes, it's one of those that is more than just a head scratcher. It's like, well, why the heck did you do that? So, but let's talk about Kirk Cousins and this new team that he's on, a new face there, coming off of a similar, the same injury as Aaron Rodgers. How is he going to, you know, play out in Atlanta? I'm seeing the Falcons being being a closer uh, challenge to Tampa Bay's reign as uh, the division champions uh, with Kirk Cousins than they ever had with uh, Ritter. And you can't convince me otherwise. The real question becomes, if uh, Kirk Cousins becomes ineffective, I mean, how long is the leash? You're, You're talking somebody that, 
got brought in, given all this money, but then had somebody draft it right behind them. I mean, how long is the leash for uh, for a quarterback like that? Is it super long because of the big contract, or is it short because you have somebody waiting in the wings and you want to see what you got? I mean, that's that's the odd, maybe the oddest thing about this whole uh, new quarterback situation that they brought upon themselves. It didn't develop. They they created this. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the front office, well, more so than the players created it themselves. Well, then it's also like if if they are on a short – if Kirk Cousins is on a short leash here, well, then that begs the question to the Falcons' front office, what the hell did you sign him to that contract for any, anyway if he's, on, if he's on this short, short leash? So, but, yeah. yeah it's almost uh, like uh, a damned if you do, damned if you don't because you uh-huh. did draft someone so early – and then, but you also signed someone with a large contract that it's like, well, we had to play him because we paid him, or well, we have to play him because we drafted him so early. It's like, well, you did that to yourselves at that point. You kind of screwed yourself over. But Ed, I can't believe you really disrespected uh, the Carolina Panthers and their chances at winning the NFC South. Almost more disrespect than the NFL giving them uh, zero primetime games. <laughs> Quit yapping. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, the Chicago Bears had the number one overall pick, and it was very expected on who they were going to get, and that is mm-hmm. Caleb Williams out of USC. Mm-hmm. Not only did they just get Caleb Williams, they also added Romo Dunze from Washington, and that instantly becomes a very intriguing one-two combo. Uh, how are we liking the Chicago Bears and this new team, per se, that they have? I mean, I think they're obviously they're obviously better, and I think they will have a better season. Uh, per- personally, again, when we're, t- when we're talking about teams that have brand new starting qu- starting quarterbacks, I have the Bears a f- a fifth on my list. Yeah. So I, yeah, I got them behind the uh, Jets, obviously Falcons, and I got the Steelers three in the in the Colts four, and I got the Bears five. Yeah, uh, that, that's a pretty decent list. And one thing that we definitely will not see in Chicago is a, a quarterback controversy because walking in, this is Caleb Williams' team. Yeah, remind me who's who's supposed to be the uh, backup quarterback. Who, who's the other quarterback in Chicago? Matthew. Oh, it's you, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's how good I am. I mean, that's how bad their quarterback room is. I should say. <laughs> They hit me up for only uh, yeah. Sundays only. But, but I will give them this, and this is something that uh, I may be jumping the gun on, but uh, when you look at Chicago's schedule, their entire divisional schedule is in the last eight weeks of the season. That is – that is, it's good and bad. There's two sides to that coin because, one – you you're developing Caleb Williams over the first half of the season without I getting beat up by your divisional rivals, but you're also giving tape to your divisional rivals by having him play the first half of the season. So I find how he, uh, how the Chicago bears schedule is formatted. How, what's it going to do? with Caleb Williams overall moving into that last half where you are playing all your divisional rivals and, oh, by the way, San Francisco in the middle of it. Yeah, that's never easy uh, when you have to face off against them. But uh, pretty much the same schedule uh, Pittsburgh Steelers have. Their last eight games will also uh, you know, contain their division as well. I don't know if the mm-hmm. NFL really – Planned on doing that for several teams, or what's the case? But yeah, Steelers play all their division games, their last eight games of the year. So uh, it's a little different situation now because let's talk about the Steelers and their quarterbacks versus the Bears. So the Bears have a rookie quarterback coming into the NFL, where the Steelers have a seasoned vet in Russell Wilson and Justin Fields, who did come over from Chicago, and we saw what he did there. So these are two quarterbacks that 
have really declined uh, as far as their what they can do. Steelers picked them up for the very cheap. They are pretty much going to be playing for a contract because they both will be free agents next year. So we know how pe- players get come contract year. They want to show you the best uh, uh, that they can and get that nice contract. So this is different. We're not used to seeing this with the Pittsburgh Steelers. We saw how Ben Roethlisberger, how we had him for so many years, and we didn't really know how it was going to change. Then we got Kenny Pickett, and we saw <laughs> uh, what happened there, and now we have Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. So how are you guys uh, liking this for the Pittsburgh Steelers? Because it is a little different than what we're used to seeing. I think if we were talking about um, the best circus in the NFL, I think the Steelers have a very good case. At, at winning that thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it very well could be. I've actually got a, a few thoughts here. Uh, I disagree with you, Matthew, on it's been a big decline for both. I think Russell Wilson was in the absolute worst offense to fit his skill set in Denver because he is a play action and – go make a play if it's not open type of quarterback. And you put him with Mike Tomlin, what's the offense? It's run the ball, play action, get your receivers down the field, and let him chuck it and do his thing. I think that fits uh, Russell Wilson better than being in Sean Payton's offense, which was very much let's put everybody out and out in the pattern and – the read is going to dictate where the ball goes. Yeah. So I I really feel like Russell Wilson will be the starting quarterback over Justin Fields. Justin Fields will be a slash player. And by no means do I think Justin Fields regressed so much that he is a throwaway. I just think the Bears wanted to turn over every three years like they always do every three years into getting another, this is the generational talent of our lifetime type of quarterback. <laughs> and <clears throat> Justin Fields needs to develop. Well, he can develop with Russell Wilson. And when you take a look at this schedule for Pittsburgh, and Matthew, you know this as well as anybody that I can speak to on this, does Russell Wilson go to the bye and then they make a decision of, How's it going, and do we have a better shot with Justin Fields, or do they ride Russell Wilson the entire way using Justin Fields as a package quarterback? Well, you know, it's hard to decide. Can Mike Tomlin continue his uh, 500 or better season? And at that buy is when they're really going to assess that as, well, how are we looking? But ultimately we want to make the playoffs, and it is a – a gauntlet of opponents that the Steelers are going to have to face their last eight, nine games after that bye, And uh, I think that they will stick with uh, uh, Russell Wilson the entire year. I do think that uh, they will uh, work in Justin Fields here and there, add him some packages. I mean, he could be a real good Taysom Hill. I'll tell you that he could be a real good Taysom Hill. We've already heard some of the rumors of him being on kick return. So uh, not Jordan Stewart. Well, yeah, actually, on, yes, I know, on, I know. I had to keep up with the times right now, at least with the Taysom Hill <laughs> uh, uh, comparison. But yes, the Cordell Stewart comparison. I mean, what he did for the Steelers in the playoffs, uh, <laughs> it was amazing. But uh, yes, Justin Fields, I think, will be here and there. But Russell Wilson will be the the starting quarterback the entire year, unless he just is that atrocious by the bye week. But I just don't see that happening. Yeah, well, I mean, I think if Russell Wilson does crash in in, in Pittsburgh, then I think that will just be all the proof you need that he that as Ed said, like he really was in the perfect situation in Seattle. And it's really funny about Russell Wilson because, and I'm not, I'm absolutely not saying that Russell Wilson's a Hall of Famer. He is absolutely not. But I don't think you can argue against me when I said that he was on his way to being a Hall, a Hall, Hall of Famer. I mean, he's already got a ring with the Seahawks. And he had a, a few really good seasons with them. Like, he was on his way, and now that's just pretty much crashed down to earth. 
Yeah, and he may realize that. that's the thing is that I think they're in a good position because you have several players that are are playing for contracts this year. Two of them being their quarterbacks, they're starting running back with Najee Harris. So I, I think that you're going to see some of the best production out of those players. And for Russell Wilson, he wants to become a Hall of Famer. That's ultimately you know a goal is to do that. He knows he's a fringe player right now, so mm-hmm. he would have to do a lot more, and he still thinks he has plenty of years left if you ask him. So yeah. uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, this next team, you have uh, – there's a different situation here because you have a quarterback who's pretty much been a backup in most of his NFL career, and then you have a young up-and-comer, and that is for – I almost said the Oakland Raiders, but the Las Vegas Raiders uh, – Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell. We saw what Aiden O'Connell did for the Raiders last year. He gave them actually a good spark. And this is all pretty much when Antonio Pierce took over. You saw a different Raiders team. And they are a team that I think you really need to keep an eye on. And I think the Gardner Minshew fit is actually a great fit for the Raiders. Uh, There was a lot of speculation. Would they trade up? Would they draft a Jaden Daniels in the NFL draft? How much would they really do in that draft? Well, The Raiders, uh, with Devontae Adams being there and now getting Brock Bowers, they got better. And they had some key additions on uh, defense this free agency, too. So they definitely got better as as a team. But quarterback-wise, Gardner mentioned Aiden O'Connell. Do you see any of them being the future of the Raiders? No. I mean, no no disrespect to – I mean, certainly not Gardner Minshew – because how long has Gardner Minshew been in the league now? Four, maybe like maybe five years at this point. Yeah. I mean, unless he gets thrown into the absolute perfect situation, no. And then same thing with a uh, same thing with a uh, Aiden O'Connell, which, yeah. I, I mean, mean I- you, can, you can stick around in this league for a long time as a spot starter, backup quarterback, and that is Gardner Minshew's role at this point. Hey, yeah, look at Ryan Ryan Fitzpatrick, Fitzmagic. Come on, David. The Bucks. I mean, he practically played for every NFL team, but uh, it, <laughs> it, they are one in the same. When you look at Gardner Minshew and Ryan Fitzpatrick, the only difference is Ryan Fitzpatrick went to Harvard. Gardner Minshew went to Washington State. Enough said there. But <laughs> it's just uh, neither of these quarterbacks are the future for the Raiders, but I think they are – good right now in this situation for the Raiders because the Raiders are not expected to be uh, a playoff team, a Super Bowl contender team, but they do have some key players on their team that I think any quarterback would love to have. And Ed knows all too well, Devontae Adams, if you have him at a receiver, you're loving that. And now Brock Bowers, who we've seen and being one of the best tight ends in all of college football, now being on your team, you are going to love that as a quarterback. So I think the situation right now is fine. Longevity and future-wise, I would not say so. Yeah, I mean, it's you can say it's fine right now, sure. But you cannot have a guy like Devontae Adams and then, you know, a guy like a guy like Brock Bowers, arguably the best – one of the best tight end prospects that we've, that we've ever seen and not have a clear-cut franchise quarterback. I mean, like that's just – again, like it might be fine – it's fine this year – but if the Raiders don't draft a franchise quarterback, that one guy who can just change everything with guys like Adams and and and, and Bowers, that's just straight up incompetence right there. Hear me the out. Only, Hear me, oh, uh, the only reason why the the Raiders will not draft a quarterback in the first round next year is if Aiden O'Connell comes in and is just the man. Mm-hmm. If if it relies on Gardner Minshew. They're going to be trading up to find to get a quarterback in the draft next year, because uh, I'm, you know, I'm looking at now that we have the schedule, we can see how this kind of dictates uh, how these quarterback uh, situations are running, and I do see that the last possibility of a road cold game for the uh, for the Raiders is Week 13 at Kansas City. Everything after that is warm weather or dome. Yeah. And that is that is prime situation to get controlled environments for a young quarterback to show you what they have. And if they are in the midst of the playoff run with him, it's going to be all the better. If it's Gardner Minshew up until that point, 
you put Aiden O'Connell in to see what you got. Uh, there's no way that, in my mind, Gardner Minshew is finishing this season unless there's injury that forces him to be the man, be the starting quarterback, much like last year with the Colts. And he actually led them to a playoff run, didn't come up, came up a little short, but he they were still in the mix up until the very end with Gardner Minshew. So he's not a complete scrub, but he is not a – a true starting quarterback in this league. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, hear me out here, but I, I, I say the Raiders tank for Carson Beck. They somehow get Stetson Bennett and they reunite the band. Uh, Georgia Bulldogs, who's going to be the better quarterback with uh, Brock Bowers? <laughs> uh, they're all going to the Eagles. Didn't you get the memo? Not those yeah. two. Not those two. <laughs> yeah, the Philadelphia Bulldogs. But... Yeah, the Philadelphia Bulldogs, <laughs> always. I know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how who's going to end up as their quarterback at the end of the year. Uh, Indianapolis Colts coming in at number six. Anthony Richardson, Joe Flacco, and Anthony Richardson came off a you know a rookie year where he got hurt. He showed promise in the first part until he got hurt. Uh, they have Joe Flacco there as well. Joe Flacco showed what he was able to do with the Browns last year, which was crazy up until the playoffs. And then you saw the old Joe Flacco come out. Uh, he went over to the Colts here in free agency, but Anthony Richardson is who they want as their future. And if he could stay healthy, uh, they're going to have a really bright future in my opinion. Uh, and we may see an AFC South that comes down to it every year with the Colts and the Texans among these young quarterbacks and the Jaguars if uh, uh, Lawrence can continue to do what he's doing. So how are you guys like in this situation here? Joe Flacco, we could talk briefly about him being a, a backup, what he, especially what he did last year with Cleveland. But mm-hmm. Anthony Richardson, who's who I really want to talk about, is if he comes back healthy, how, where, what is the ceiling for the Colts this year? Well, I mean, when it comes to Ant- – listen, Anthony Richardson is a freak athlete. We all know that. And I don't think I'm being crazy here when I say that Anthony Richardson is probably a top five athletic quarterback. Athletic quarterback, okay? You know, being athletic and actually having the ability to be a quarterback are two totally different things. And a lot of things by Anthony Richardson are raw. We all know that he got picked because of his raw talent and because how high his ceiling is and his potential – and, and, and all that, right? So I think, I mean, listen, I can't sit here and tell you for sure that Anthony Richardson is going to just blossom. I think he still has a lot of, you know, growing to do right now. But certainly he has the physicality. He has the he has the tools to be a good quarterback for, for the Colts. I mean, as I said, he's an athletic, he's an athletic freak. And whether or not that athleticism can actually tra- translate into – quarterbacking I think has yet to be seen and obviously as a you know as a as a gator of course I'm rooting for him but we'll just have to see how it is with him <laughs> yeah. well what I what I see with Anthony Richardson is he was drafted as a physical freak not necessarily a quarterback skills freak so I think that year of him being injured and being in the film room, learning the fundamentals of NFL quarterbacking because they are totally different than what they were in college, uh, which he didn't have as much time in college. So he's, he's very raw mentally. You, as can, well think, as you can think his dumbass coach Mullen for uh, not starting him over at Emory <laughs> Jones when he should have. Okay. I'll do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that year of him being in those film rooms, he, he can think the game. Hopefully he learned how to think the game through while he's was rehabbing through most of the season. And now you bring in Joe Flacco that can teach him how to think the game through and turn those physical freak skills and get him to where he can think it fast enough to where he can let the physicality just flow and not rely on just the physical part but be able to know what he's doing when he is having to step out of the framework of an offense. Yeah, I think actually adding Joe Flacco is going to help. If only he could have had him last year to uh, really 
sitting behind him and being able to see what Joe Flacco is able to do. And keep in mind, Joe Flacco has won a Super Bowl. Yes, he may or may not have had help due to a power outage, but he still has won a Super Bowl. <laughs> he, 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 had, he had an all-time great run, man. Yeah. He, touchdowns and one or no interceptions. Yeah, and he he did. He, he would – Every year when the Steelers would play the Ravens and Joe Flacco was there, it was always a matchup. So I do want to give him his his props because Joe Flacco has done a lot in the NFL. And Anthony Richardson, even if he does start above Joe Flacco, he's going to have a guy who has had so much experience in the NFL really teach him a thing or two. So uh, bringing Joe Flacco in was very smart by the Colts because uh, he's no Gardner Minshew, who they had as their backup last year. Um, number seven, the Vikings with Sam Darnold and they did draft JJ McCarthy. It was almost like that was predicted to happen that JJ McCarthy was going to be a Viking, uh, you know, being, uh, from Michigan and all that, uh, very close ties that they wanted him bad. It, it might've seemed like a smoke screen, but they had made it really apparent that they wanted him, but it ended up being reality. And they did make it happen by drafting him. But before they drafted him, they did uh, sign Sam Darnold. So does Sam Darnold start? Does J.J. McCarthy start? I think that's the question. I'm I'm going to lean Sam Darnold to begin with. This He is serviceable enough to let to give J.J. McCarthy at least, at least a little runway to get ramped up. Um, and... Do I have anything to base that on? Not really, uh, but you're not taking J.J. McCarthy to throw the football all over the yard and be the quarterback savior. You're taking J.J. McCarthy to lead a lead a team and do the things that will not kill you in the long run to lead you to uh, more wins in, in the late season football games. Where... Whereas this year, you're not going to see Minnesota have much need for that outdoor, I've got to play within myself because of the elements that I'm working, that I'm playing in, uh, to be successful. Uh, they, they wind up uh, only being outside once after Thanksgiving. And that's, that's not a huge deal for it. Uh, but Sam Darnold, he's probably going to have a short leash, uh, like we were talking about before. Uh, however, J.J. McCarthy does need at least maybe a little seasoning to see how the flow of going, you know, through travel in the NFL, go through those uh, those things that are not shown on the field, how to be a professional, those things. Because that's important, especially for a young quarterback that we know was taken to be the face of the franchise. He's just not uh, hes not going to be that on day one, the way Caleb Williams is being expected to. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I agree that Sam Darnold will, will probably start off as the starter. But I think as the season goes on, I think J.J. McCarthy, when he's more comfortable in the system and he's just more kind of, you know, um, like he's more, he's just more comfortable. I think he'll be the starter by the, uh, by the end of the season. Yeah. And I don't care how much, uh, you know, he's going to meditate. You can't throw him out to the pack of wolves that quick. Uh, I think you need to let him sit behind Sam Darnold to acclimate to that. Also, like, am I, am I crazy or I, I don't know, maybe I am, but I honestly do not see any quarterbacks, at least not like the quarterbacks that were drafted, excuse me, quarterbacks that were drafted and uh, that were drafted this year. I don't foresee any of them being faces of the franchise. Not Caleb Williams, not, not Jaden Daniels, not JJ McCarthy. I mean, maybe I'm being harsh here, but just I don't really get, get that vibe from, from any of the quarterbacks. Ah. Uh. I mean, maybe maybe Spencer Rattler in New Orleans. <laughs> I mean, it, I say that jokingly, but at the same time, they don't really have any future there, quarterback. So possibly if he ends up, you know, really getting better. Yeah, I mean, but I see, I see what you're saying though. 
I, I see what you're saying, and there's a quarterback that we're going to talk about here in a little bit that I, I would challenge you with, uh, with that statement. So we'll get there. It's definitely Michael Pratt. No, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. So yeah, I agree with you guys. Having Sam Darnold being the starting quarterback, very very short leash. And there, uh, and yeah. their bye week is week six. Very uh, early. after they've after they've played San Francisco and at Green Bay. So, and you talk about short runway. Uh, they go through that and then get the bye week. That's that's their assessment time to see if we need to go ahead and throw JJ out there or if we need to just hang on for a bit. Yeah. Yep. Um, Washington, they had the number two overall pick and they drafted the uh, defending Heisman Trophy winner, Jaden Daniels. And this was also another one of those that seemed pretty obvious that it was going to happen. Jaden Daniels does have a lot of talent. Um, you know, unless it's windy, uh, he's so skinny, he may fly away like a kite, but, uh, there's probably a reason Chicago didn't draft him. They are the windy city after all, but, uh, Jaden Daniels, he really showed what he can do in college football, but can he really show what he could do in the NFL? Uh, Ed, I'm gonna actually have you to start on, on this one. Uh, Jaden Daniels, he He feasted on the fact that he was the fastest guy on the field and he was the most dynamic and explosive player on the field. The difference becomes what happens when everybody else around you is just as fast and just as explosive as you are. You've got to be able to be nuanced as a quarterback. I I feel like this is very much an RG3 situation without them drafting a uh, they did draft a. Um, didn't they draft a another quarterback later in the draft to kind of back him up and say just in case? They kind of like RG three with Kirk Cousins. Yes, they they absolutely did, and gosh, it's gonna drive me nuts to figure out who they did. But I'll look that up while you continue to talk, Ed. <laughs> okay, uh, so <clears throat> that. That is my big concern with Jaden Daniels, but it's his it's his show. There's not going to be a, any controversy. There's not anybody that is in camp that is going to be, you know, clamoring, you know, seeing who's going to split reps with the number one unit. He, it's going to be him all the way through. And, you know, just because I'm going down this rabbit hole right now, I want to take you all with me. Um, Jaden Daniels. Uh, playing at LSU, lots of hot hot games, uh, lots of humid games, lots of games that were not uh, subject to snow and wind and ice and rain uh, the way that he will find in Washington. But I will say that his last road cold game is uh, going to be – in week 11 at Philadelphia. And that's going to be a very difficult environment for him. But being out of LSU, I mean, how do you not, how can you not understand what a tough road environment is coming out of LSU at this point? David? Uh, Really quick. It was Sam Hartman who they drafted. Yes. So Sam Hartman. And they also picked up Marcus Mariota in free agency too. (laughs) Uh, Captain Handsome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, certainly I agree that this is Jaden Daniels' show right now. Yes. But I just don't see him being the long term answer for, you know, for Washington right now. And that's no disrespect to Jaden Daniels because I said the exact same thing for pretty much every, you know, every other, uh, every other quarterback. Yeah. I, I think we need to see how he's going to play because. If he could adjust to the NFL and the speed and the size of the players, unlike college football, uh, I think he can. Oh, similar to almost uh, Anthony Richardson. Anthony Richardson, though, is is almost double the size of, <laughs> of Jaden Daniels, but he's, he's a big guy. But Jaden Daniels, though, if he can adjust to that and take those hits, I mean, he's playing in the same division as the Micah Parsons uh, and the Philadelphia Eagles, I mean, so the Georgia Bulldogs, like yeah. we said earlier. And those are some monsters out there. So if he could take those hits and he shows that his worth, I think he could have 
a, a good career in the NFL for Washington, but that is to be determined. Also, and like if you're if you're basically comparing this to a RG three, then are you also saying that eventually Jaden Daniels is going to retire from fo- football? I know RG three isn't technically retired, but you know what I mean. Are you saying that eventually Jaden Daniels is going to become arguably the most annoying sports media member like RG three? No, not not on that end. But <laughs> I will say that he may be more subject to uh, a injury that will severely derail his career in the NFL. Yeah. By the end of this first year, if he is dead set on just running and trying to make plays by himself the entire season. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Uh, so now we have another similar topic here to the Vikings, and that is the Broncos, where Broncos brought over Zach Wilson uh, this offseason, but then they went ahead and drafted Bo Nix out of Oregon. Uh, is this kind of a similar situation as the Vikings where Zach Wilson's going to start but has a very short leash before they put in Bo Nix, or is Bo Nix going to be the starter come day one? I'll be honest. I will start Bo Nix, man. Zach Wilson sucks ass. <laughs> like, I don't know what else to tell you, dude. Quite the visual. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm liking this more as a um, – Alex Smith, Patrick Mahomes uh, comp. Yes, Zach Wilson can be serviceable for a period of time, but this is who I think is going to prove David's theory wrong. I think Bo Nix is the guy that is expected to be the face of this franchise as long as uh, Sean Payton is there as the head coach. Yeah, this is the the Drew Brees 2.0 experiment with Bo Nix and Sean Payton. Uh, and Bo Nix is going to have some weapons still there. They still have yet to trade uh, uh, Cortland Sutton, and they also drafted Bo Nix's college teammate in Troy Franklin, also at receiver. So uh, we could see a little difference here. Do I think that they're going to be this elite playoff team? By no means, but... As long as Sean Payton's there, I think that he could tool Bo Nix to his liking. And it'll take at least a year. Uh, we're not talking about the Broncos being competitive uh, in that division uh, with the Chiefs. Uh, you know, this year, we're talking next year, 25, maybe 26, but it'll be before the end of uh, Bo Nix's freshman, co- uh, not freshman, rookie <laughs> contract. Yeah. Yep, yep. And lastly on this list, uh, number 10, we've got the New England Patriots. Um, Drake May. You know, Moving on. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this was, I'll tell you what, the Patriots had just such a horrible offseason. They've had a horrible last couple of years, honestly, since Tom Brady left. He really uh, took the, the soul out of Foxborough. <laughs> You can see the grin on David's face from here. <laughs> I mean, I think I think everybody who's not a Patriots fan has that same grin. No, I think Patriots fans. Uh, <laughs> I mean, well, Patriots fans they may not even like this draft pick. It's just, I'm not yeah. saying Drake May is bad. I really don't want to say that. Uh, he's also another to be determined. It's just this is such a bad situation. I feel bad for the kid because the Patriots really did not show any way of them wanting to improve. That's just how I feel about it is this was such a worse situation for him. Yes, he made it to the NFL. That is great. A lot of people can't say that they did that. Uh, but how long will he last in the NFL playing for a, a team like this right now? Because I just feel like they're the low of the low. I mean, can we see him being a Mitch Trubisky? I mean, since came out of the same school. college. It came- <laughs> Same school, you know, similar situation. You know, there's not much in the roster. Uh, I would argue that the Bears had a better roster with Mitch Trubisky there than the Patriots are giving Drake May to work with now. But didn't, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, didn't Drake May actually have, you know, two full seasons at North Carolina, whereas Trubisky only had one? That is correct. Well, Trubisky had one, one season starting. Yeah. Uh, 
but he was an older, uh, he wasn't a freshman coming out. He wasn't a sophomore coming out. Right. I believe right. he came out as a junior. Yeah. And, but, but Drake and, uh, May did start for two straight seasons. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Drake May, he does, sh- he does show that, that upside, that kind of ceiling that, that they like, but it's just, the, like I said, this situation is just not the, not good at all, and I feel bad for him. And so, with that being said, this is obvious that probably the three of us are going to say that the Patriots are number ten on our list. They are going to be the worst out of these ten teams. Actually, you'll be uh, you'll be shocked. I have the Patriots nine. The Broncos are, are last on my list. Wow, wow. I had them way higher. <laughs> hot take, a hot, hot take there, man, but. <laughs> Hey, listen. Somebody, somebody's got no belief be, in Sean Payton. Ugh. Somebody's got to be contrarian, and it might, it might as well be me. Okay, I mean, right. easy work, but it's but it's honest work. Sean Payton is also the same quarterback that developed Tony Romo. <laughs> so announcing career, got it. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's let's see if we're in agreement with at least number one here. Uh, Jets, Jets, Jets. Yeah. No. Yes. yes obviously. J-E-T-S. <laughs> Just yeah, they can, they can the spell. season. <laughs> <laughs> um, Falcons at number two? Yep. I got I'm good. Too. Okay. okay. Uh, Ed, who do you got at number three? Three, I'm putting the Steelers in. Okay, okay. You know, you've got, because you've got so much more experience and talent to go back and forth and move in between. So glad you guys said it. So I didn't have to say it and sound like I'm just this big old Steelers fan. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, Steelers at three. Four of those where I kind of have things switching up. Actually at four, I'm going to have the Colts. Same. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have, I'm going to have the Broncos. At five. (laughs) I'm, I'm a believer in, in Sean Payton and, uh, his development of quarterbacks and offense. Okay, do you have the Broncos at four or five? Sorry, at four. Okay, so Ed had them at four. Okay, me and David had the Colts at four. So I have the Broncos at five. We already know David has uh, the Broncos at ten. So who would that's you where have I have the Colts. Oh wow. Okay, so we. Well, definitely... it's funny that you. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Well, we we are talking about the Colts. Yeah. Uh, David, who do you have at five? Da Bears. Da Bears. Da Bears. Um, over here at six, um, this is where it was a little tough for me because I'm like, all right, uh, Jane Daniels is probably the, the immediate starter. So how is it going to be there or Vikings? <laughs> so, uh, Ed, who do you have there at six? I have bears. Oh, you have bears. Okay. So, okay. Did bears change. at six. Uh, David, I've got the Raiders at six. Okay. 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 Uh, so I think for me, with at six, I was gonna just stick with the the what with Washington. I think that uh, Jaden Daniels. I feel like there they got Scary Terry. They got uh, Luke McCaffrey. I, I I really like that there. Um, so that's who I got at six. Uh, number seven, uh, David. I've got the Commanders. Same. Okay. All right. Um, for me, I've got uh, the Raiders at seven, uh, just with, like I said earlier, with Brock Bowers, Devontae Adams, having them there. Uh, as a future team, no, but as a team this year, I'll put them there. Uh, eight, um, I've got the Bears. Vikings. Vikings as well. Okay. All righty. Uh, nine, uh, I have the Vikings there, uh, just because with um, – Justin Jefferson. I don't. I don't really know what's going to happen this year. There seems to be a lot of uh, tension there, so I'm not really sure how things are going to play out there. Uh, David, you have the Patriots at nine. I think you said, and yeah, Ed, nine. I've got uh, the Raiders. 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 All righty. So that is our top ten of these uh, new new uh, quarterbacks on these new teams. So uh, let us know uh, your thoughts in the comments of who you feel uh, is your rankings as well. I am going to look like either a total genius or a total fraud after this with my Broncos ranking, and there's no in between there. <laughs> 
We, uh, yeah. yeah, to be determined, just I mean, like a lot no, of these. No disrespect to Sean Payton at all, man, but like I've said it many times before, but I think Sean Payton and Drew Brees had the perfect marriage, and I just don't think he's going to replicate that with any other quarterback, in my opinion. Yeah. And I and I bring up again, Sean, Drew Brees was the second quarterback that Sean Payton developed uh, from obscurity. Obscurity, and, right. right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, we will find out there. Um, we'll get quick reaction bits here on the NBA playoff situation. Uh, no surprise here, no shocker. Boston Celtics going to the Eastern Conference Finals. I think that was kind of easily predicted by uh, well everyone outside of Cleveland. <laughs> uh, outside of Lake Erie itself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, quite frankly, I mean that was. That was really a bad matchup from the very beginning. I mean, the, the 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 Cavaliers did not have the size, did not have the length to match up with the Celtics at all. I mean, you just like you can just literally Google it, and the Celtics are one of the tallest teams in the, in the NBA. And then on the contrary, the Cavaliers are one of the shortest teams in the in, in the NBA. And so you put that together, and you got one team making quick work of the other team, and we know which team you know which teams those are. Yeah, they they also don't have they also have one of the worst offenses to going into, but they just had the injury bug. Uh, they had no depth because of it, and you, when you're playing the number one team in basketball, you need to literally have everything. And well, they 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 didn't. So it clearly showed as they only won one game. So uh, Boston Celtics on to the next and uh, uh, interesting game seven coming. Uh, the Timberwolves and the Nuggets. Timberwolves jumped out to a 2 0 lead, and that quickly changed when the Nuggets won uh, three straight. And the Timberwolves then won this last game six, forced to game seven. I, we need to talk about this, guys. Do you think the Wolves, especially how they played last game, are going to win this, or do you think the Nuggets are just too experienced? I think the Nuggets are going to take game seven. Especially if you, if you saw the picture of, of Joe. I was just going to say it. Yeah. <laughs> this has been maybe the worst series to watch. Because after the first game, it's like, whoa, this is going to be amazing. Because it was <laughs> down to the final yeah. second. Every other game has just been Blow over up. by the fourth quarter. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my goodness. And I, but, I was actually. Go ahead. I was thinking the same thing, Ed, because I don't really feel like there's been any game in this series where it was truly a back and forth between both teams from start to finish. Like every, pretty much every single game, you could automatically tell right away who the better team was, and then they would just you know carry carry, carry that over. Yeah, but I will say, yes, you have Jokic with his three MVPs now, but. Does Ant Edwards get that n- next next big star in line? That that Michael Jordan moment over Craig Elo. Does he get that moment in this game? Because it took a playoff winning shot, which may be the most famous NBA shot in history. It took something like that for people to think. Michael Jordan could be more than just a scorer. So if Anthony Edwards can pull the the T Wolves uh, in out beyond the Nuggets by hitting a game winning shot at the end of this, does that elevate him into that next big thing uh, when it comes to the NBA? I think it could easily propel him, uh, but I just don't see it happening. Uh, I don't. Uh, I like Anthony Edwards. I just it may not be his time just yet, and I think uh, I think the Joker is going to have something to say about that. I mean, I think. I mean, when it comes to when it will be Anthony Edwards' time, I mean, for, like if you if you look throughout NBA history, like how did pretty much every or most star stars emerge, right? Like they went through trials and tribulations. I mean. With Michael Jordan, he had to go through the the uh, the bad boys, and it, t- it took him um, what seven, six, seven, eight years, something like that, before he you know finally won his f- uh, first ring. And then you know with with LeBron, he had an he had a historically terrible terrible series against the, the Mavericks, 
And then that finally propelled him into winning his first championship afterward. Something similar needs to happen to Anthony Edwards. And whether that's just he faces a team that just constantly gets the better of him or he just has an all-time terrible game, all-time ter- terrible series where he gets all the scrutiny and he ultimately lets that you know fuel him. But, uh, yeah, all in all, I think uh, – I mean, the Nuggets are experienced, and I think that's going to help them win. And I think Joker is just going to have the game of his life, Game 7. Yeah, he may need to. Uh, he may need to because this Timberwolves team is very talented. Yeah. And uh, another talented team that has kind of been shocking a little bit, but it, that's the OKC okay, Thunder. Uh A lot of people were not shy with going into the playoffs that they wanted to play the Thunder even though the Thunder were the number one seed. And the Pelicans learned the hard way in the first round that that's not who you wanted to play as they got swept against the Thunder. And going into this series, I didn't think Dallas had any chance. I mean, I ranked Dallas pretty low on my rankings because I did. I just felt like they couldn't really find their identity. Well, Dallas is up 3-2 to two right now. And they're looking to close this series out at home. Is this is this going to happen? Is Dallas going to pull off this major upset against OKC? It's going to go back to OKC. It it's it's one of those series where everybody wants to score and nobody wants to play defense. <laughs> I you know you know Luca you know, defense you, what yeah yeah Luca what. That's all Luca wants to do. Uh, that's all Kyrie wants to do. Uh, so why not just let him do it? Uh, so even the least bit of actual defense being played puts the series back in OKC. And with the effort that that young team is giving, I don't see how they don't give that kind of effort and get it back home for a game seven. I... I disagree completely. I I think the Mavericks are going to take game six. And I picked the Mavericks to win the series, and I felt very comfortable picking them because the Mavericks are an older veteran team. I mean, they got guys like Luka and Kyrie, you know, two vets who have gone deep into the playoffs. Now, funny enough, I mentioned those guys, and they haven't, they haven't even, like, been that great in the series for, for the Mavs. I mean, it's for the Mavs, it's guys like P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford with his defensive effort, right? But I felt comfortable picking the Navs, but Navs, the Mavs, because of their older veteran presence. I don't care that the Thunder were the number one team in the NBA. I don't care that they had one of the best, you know best offenses. At some point, your youth does catch up to you, and I think that's exactly you know what we're seeing right now. And in a way, it's funny because I feel like we're kind of seeing deja deja vu here because this reminds me of well over ten years ago when the Thunder were that young up and coming team with K- KD Harden. Abaka, you know, Westbrook. And then they ran into just like just like, you know, we're seeing now, an older veteran Mavs team. And that and that youth eventually caught up with the Thunder. So uh obviously I wouldn't be surprised if the Thunder forced a game seven, but I think, you know, the game being uh, being in Dallas and Mavericks and the Mavericks just being that veteran team, um, I think they're going to uh, uh pull this one away and uh clinch a spot in the Western Conference finals. Yeah, and speaking of uh, forcing Game 7, it really looks like right now uh, the Pacers are going to be doing that as they're up almost 20 points on the Knicks with only about three minutes left to play. So uh, it's going back to New York, going back to the Garden. Kudos to them. I mean, I thought I, re- I truly thought New York was going to make quick, uh, quick work of Indiana in five, and obviously I was wrong. Gosh, I hope they lose at the Garden in front of Spike Lee. Gosh, I, I hope they do, but I didn't, I didn't know you didn't like the Knicks. I just don't like Spike Lee <laughs> in front of Billy Joel. Billy it's... Joel, yeah, <laughs> piano man, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's just a quick update there. Yeah, so it sounds like the Pacers will be uh, heading back or heading to New York to face off Game Seven there in the Garden. So uh, we'll talk more about that uh, to come. But I really want to talk about the NHL. Uh, because speaking of the Garden, uh, New York Rangers have advanced to the Eastern Conference Finals. It's going to be fun. that They, they may have to battle with uh, the Knicks uh, as far as uh, how the games are going to be played there. 
since they do play at the same uh, arena. But uh, the Rangers show that they were a little too much for uh, the Canes to handle, although that was a great series. Uh, uh, the range or the Canes were up three to one in Game Six uh, at home, going into the third, and, and then Chris Chris Kreider and the Rangers just. Uh, really took over. Uh, the curse is still uh, still not really there. They're still showing that they uh, – they. Uh, I mean, it's, I think only five teams in the last 15 years that have won the President's Trophy have advanced to the conference final. So it shows you that it, it does become pretty hard to do when you have that uh, President's Trophy curse kind of lingering over you. But uh, the Panthers have – now closed out that series against the Bruins. Uh, it was a great goalie matchup, but Swayman unfortunately just couldn't continue to uh, carry his team on the back. And David, I think you have some a uh, uh, pretty uh, wild stat on this series. Well, forget goalie matchup. I mean, this was just the case of just completely just total shutdown defense. I mean, the Panthers held the Bruins to under twenty shots for three straight games. And, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that in those three straight games where the Bruins were held under 20 shots a game that the Panthers had won th- three straight. I mean, l- listen, the Panthers were one of the best defensive teams uh, in the regular season. And right now they've been absolutely the best defensive team in the playoffs. Yeah, they could be that wall that uh, New York runs into very easily uh, in mm-hmm. this next series. So that's going to be another uh, all-star type of matchup there. And also, by the way, since we mentioned them before, I mean, with the Hurricanes, are are they going to are are the Hurricanes and Rodman Bauer going to part ways? Uh, That's going to be one of those situations where it's going to be a typical NHL where they just they let them go halfway through next year's season (laughs) because if they are really serious about things, I think that I think they do because. He just shows that he can't get over the second round. But it's going to be hard because we have to remember that this guy is a Raleigh legend. Like, mm-hmm. I'm I'm pretty sure this guy captained them to their only Stanley Cup win. He did. He did. And then he took over. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be tough letting uh, kind of like a homegrown guy go. But I think eventually it does happen, yes. So that, that I'm glad you brought that up. But now to the main event, we need to talk about this this crazy event that took place. I'm sure all you guys woke up this morning, Friday morning, and saw on your phone that the number one golfer in the world, Scotty Scheffler, was detained by police on his <laughs> way to Valhalla. And this was crazy. I thought I was dreaming when I saw this. I instantly texted Ed. I was like, is this this is this the only thing that's going to stop Scotty Scheffler from winning this weekend? Uh, turns out that no, no, not yet at least. Um, uh, this was crazy to even just read up on because uh, unfortunately someone did pass away this morning in an accident outside of Valhalla. This was not by Scotty Scheffler by any means, but there was an event that did take place where someone did uh, pass away, and because of that, there was traffic. It was uh, raining. It was crazy uh, just events happening where there was traffic and Scotty Scheffler uh, uh, thought he was following the police by them telling him to go this way. He drove over a, uh, a medium or some type of curb and long story short, dragged a police officer by the car and was arrested because of it. Now faces uh, uh, some counts of uh, criminal, uh, what was it? Uh, he dragged the police officer. What did they call on that now? Second degree, um, uh, assault on a police officer, reckless driving and, uh, running over a median. Yeah. It's, so. <laughs> I mean, to me, it just sounded like they were stacking charges to make it look legitimate. And it, I don't <laughs> think it really was. Yeah, where's that body cam footage? I want to see it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone wants to see it. But, uh, David, 
Well, I think like what's really like what's really funny about this whole thing is just how com- totally nonchalant Scotty Scheffler has been. He's just been like, yeah, I was arrested. You know, I, I spent I spent some time behind bars. It, you know, it is what it is. I was able to get get a good workout, and the police officers were were very nice, by the way. Yeah, I was arrested. Uh, I, I <laughs> yeah, I uh, did my stretching in the jail cell, and then I came out and shot a sixty six. Or it's another day in the office and, I, and i've seen like i've seen people i've seen people say this on, on twitter and i 100 percent agree but like usually whenever a celebrity says do you know who i am it's just kind of cheesy but this is probably the only one of the very rare situations where do you even know who i am would actually work <laughs> especially because the police were there guarding the entrance to the event that he was trying to get to yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, yeah. come on. It's like, I'm Scotty Shuffler. I am, you're blocking the area that I literally need to go to right now. Yeah. I don't have like a badge to show you, but come on, just look at me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Who the, who, who the hell is Scotty Shuffler? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and, and if he did do something wrongdoing, I, I don't want to come up with any excuses for those. So, we, we, you know, we will wait for more details to come out. Uh, but Scotty Scheffler, that, that was the, the main event pretty much that happened this morning, but I want to go over the leaderboard here really quick because, uh, there, there's a, another guy at the top right now, actually, who, uh, f- was on top after day one and is now on top after day two. And that's, uh, Xander Schauffele, Xander Schauffele over at 12 under, uh, top of the leaderboard. Uh, he didn't, he didn't show really any, excuse me, any signs of really slowing down going into this uh, second round where I thought he played very well golf. Uh, Following behind him was Colin Morikawa. We saw what Colin Morikawa was able to do at the Masters. He surged up into uh, the leaderboard. Uh, It did uh, kind of fizzle off uh, come the final day, but Colin Morikawa has always had an amazing iron game, and today he showed that very, very well. And uh, Thigala coming in at 10 under, followed by Bryson DeChambeau at 9-under and Scotty Scheffler at 9-under. So uh, Scheffler is still up there in the top five, and I think going into these final two rounds, I think that uh, he'll continue to be up there too. Um, So, uh, David, do you have any thoughts on uh, the top of the leaderboard or even more in the Scotty Scheffler situation? Well, I, I've got thoughts on who number one is. I mean, it seems to me like if you have a if you have a last name that has like that chef Schaff sound, then you know you're probably uh, in good hands. I mean, Scheffler and Schaffle sound almost exact, almost exactly the same. And then Mar- Morikawa was two, or was yes. he three? Yep, he was two. Okay, I mean, I, I hope. I mean, personally, I hope Morikawa, you know, does well, especially after the way he kind of you know, kind of choked on the final day at the Masters. That was really, really rough to watch. Um, so I hope for his sake he, he does well. But, yeah, that's yeah. pretty much all I got. Yeah, Bryson DeChambeau actually had a really great day today. I want to say that he started out three under. So, I mean, he was six under on the day, bringing him up to nine under. So uh, yeah. Bryson DeChambeau uh, really showing that uh, – he wants to represent Liv, uh, <laughs> and uh, he wants to show him what's this fifty-four holes that we're talking about, right? <laughs> but uh, we'll see if he could continue to do it. Uh, Ed, um, do you have any comments on the situation? Uh, Ed, uh, you're muted. Muted. Well, really quick while Ed fix his uh, microphone there. Uh, go ahead right now and drop your predictions on wh- how you feel the rest of the tournament's going to play out and if Scotty Scheffler is going to continue to uh, really assert his dominance on these tournaments and win another one. Y'all got me? Yes. Yep, we're good. <clears throat> so with this, with today's round, I uh, just wanted to make a couple of comments on it. Um Tiger Woods, I he had another subpar round and I was not going to make the weekend uh, because I believe the cut line was uh, minus one uh, for uh, for the tournament. 
So he won't be around this weekend. He did show some flashes of who Tiger Woods is, uh, but he also this had some difficulty with the uh, soft and muddy terrain that Valhalla had from all the rain that they have had over this week uh, going into the weekend. But it's supposed to clear up for tomorrow, so we should see some really good scores. Xander Shoffley, uh, he played a very solid round. He did not play a spectacular round. And he didn't truly distance himself uh, from the rest of the pack, uh, starting off at minus 9. Now he's at minus 12. So he didn't really do a whole lot there. And that is leaving the door open for Scotty to, to come in and bust the door down. Yeah. If he if Scotty comes in with another round like he had today, then I I don't see how we do not see those two in the final pairing on the on Sunday. Uh, but the only one that I can see having something to say about that at this point is Colin Morikawa. Well, He's, also he played an excellent round. And also, like you know, when it comes to when it comes to Tiger, when it comes to Tiger, I, mean, I said it before. And I'll say it again, I 100% stand behind this, but I really think Tiger should have retired after he won his last Masters. I understand that goes completely against his competitive nature, but, like, don't you want your last time to be remembered as a champion rather than, like, you, you know, barely saving your legacy? Yeah, there's going to be that time where he is going to have, have to officially hang them up, but I don't know when we are going to see that times. But another thing to add also on Tiger is uh, going into today at the PGA Championship, he had never had a triple bogey. And, well, he had two of them in the first five holes. So this was uh, not starting out well for Tiger. I mean, he was trying to play catch up, and he was just way too far off from the cut line. I mean, I want to say he finished eight or nine over in the cut line at being at – uh, one under, so pretty uh, far off. Yeah, it's going to be a very interesting weekend uh, because you're seeing some of the biggest names in golf actually did make the cut line <clears throat> uh, with Tony Finau, with Rory McIlroy. You know, despite his uh, legal legal things going on this week, uh, <laughs> along with. Uh, Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth, uh, although I did not see where he finished up. Uh, Brooks Kepka. I mean, these are all all players that are within striking distance, and it's going to be an interesting weekend to say the least. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Brooks Kepka being the defending champ. So go ahead and keep an eye out on him. I think he actually he uh, did very uh, he did pretty well today to at least stay in the hunt. So. Uh, Go ahead and keep an eye on him. But, uh, yeah, guys, that's pretty much what, all we have today. Uh, if you go ahead and uh, leave that like, subscribe, hit that button, share these videos, and uh, go ahead and comment on how you feel like it's going to play out on the leaderboard come going into Sunday, the PGA Championship, as well as the NBA NHL playoffs, uh, who's going to join the Celtics uh, in the Eastern Conference Finals, and uh, – how are we going to see things play out in the West? And same thing can be said in the NHL playoffs also. But um, we appreciate you guys tuning in, continue to tune in, and uh, give us guys your opinions on how you feel about everything. We really do appreciate that. Uh, until next time, guys, we are rounding third, and we are headed for home. <laughs>